Dan Perry, and this is Tuesday, April the 5th. This is the Energy and Environment Committee. Uh, we do not have a quorum, but we will begin. And uh, Mr. CLA, if you would tell me whether we have any consent items. Yes, you do, Madam Chair. We'd like to recommend for consent item number one, which relates to uh, Bureau of Sanitation Report, uh, requesting authority to apply for grant funding from the Mobile Source Air Pollution Reduction Review Committee. Okay, that, that's fine. Uh, no other uh, consent items? No, actually, that'll, that'll... All right. Well, then why don't we start with number two? Number two. Public Works report regarding mitigated neck deck relative to the Albion Dairy Project. Staff from Board of Public Works. Okay. Good morning, Council Members. My name is Deborah Weintraub from the Bureau of Engineering, and I have with me... Kendrick. Kendrick Okuda, Bureau of Engineering. Good morning, Madam Chair. Maria Martin with the Bureau of Engineering. Pull the mic closer. Maria Martin with the Bureau of Engineering. Good morning. We're here to talk to you about the Albi and Dairy Mitigative Negative Deck, uh, Negative Declaration Environmental Clearance. And I just briefly want to say that it uh, gives me great pleasure to be here um, on behalf of the Bureau of Engineering as a leader in environmental uh, clearance and compliance, and as the lead in the program implementation for the $500 million Prop O program. Um, to date, we've completed two full EIRs for this program, uh, five mitigated negative decks, and a host of other permits, including water cost permits, permits with the Army Corps. Uh, one, one document was both a NEPA, a federal and a state environmental clearance. Um, with that, I'm going to let Kendra tell you a little bit specifically about the clearance that's in front of you today. Great. Thank you, Deborah. So, Madam Chair, this, this is a mitigated neck deck for the Albion Dairy Project. It's a six-acre site located adjacent to the L.A. River. Um, Propositional purchased the property in November 2009, and recently the uh, tenant has vacated the property. So for the purposes of the environmental clearance, we've um, separated the project into, th into three phases. Demolition and remediation being the first, the second being the stormwater improvements, the BMPs, if you will, that are going to be propo, that are propo uh, related, and the final phase being the recreational elements and incorporation of the propo Albion Dairy project into and uh, with the adjacent um, Downey Rec Center. So um, the schedule of of getting the um, Oh, the project is currently in the demolition design phase, and we're hoping to award the demolition remediation contract in June of this year and complete that in about a year. Uh, we did conduct public outreach for the project. The project did apply for a state Proposition 84 grant, which unfortunately it didn't get, but we're going to reapply again. During the course of that, uh, the grant scoping, um, five, community me five community meetings were held where we were able to uh, look at... Uh, I get feedback from the community. And finally, um, we did receive public comment on the MND, none of which impacted the final um, findings. What's the ultimate objective or project for this site? The, ult the ultimate objective is to create water quality improvements adjacent to the LA River. This is a 200, this is a 254 acre foot watershed, so it's going to be bringing off-site stormwater onto the site for treatment and then uh, release back into the LA River and then to have passive or other recreational uses on site as well as with the adjacent park. What kind of contamination do you expect to find at this site? Um, we expect hydrocarbons, possibly uh, creosol and other things related to the uh, railway, which this site was has a railway spur in it. Um, we also expect lead and asbestos in the buildings. And um, what's the treatment for that type of tr treatment and disposal of that sort of contamination? We would be remediating and uh, disposal off-site. Okay. Um, and for other governmental agencies involved in this, uh, what sorts of responses have you received? Um, we received two responses. Well, we received one response from the AQMD with related, which related to the air quality um, for the final project. And uh, we did air quality monitoring on that and determined that the air quality was well below any risk thresholds for the final project. The project is adjacent to active railway yards, so we were, AQMD wanted us to test the, uh, the air. Okay. All right. Anybody else have any other comments? No? Okay, well, we'll make this a communication from the chair. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. 
takes us to number three, which relates to motion Perry Cardinals relative to authorization to execute an agreement with PA Consulting to conduct an independent third-party review of DDP's IRP-related matters. We have staff from our office as well as the CAO's office with respect to this matter. Okay. Submitted a report on this matter as well yesterday. And do we have one? Yes. It's actually here. Okay. Madam Chair, with respect to this item, this motion is primarily a response to the various motions and actions we've taken by counsel over the course of the past year with respect to conducting a review of the IRP, which has now been released by the Department of Water and Power in November, as well as a variety of actions with regard to unbundling the ECAF, as was an action that was taken by counsel last year, and a review of revenue requirements study when that is completed by the Department of Water and Power, as well as a restructuring of the water rates and power rates as well, too. So this contract is a consolidated agreement to review all those elements over the course of the next year, contingent upon the actions taken by the Board of Water and Power. Okay. Olivia Cetis-Vallelonga from the CAO's office. In addition to those motions, we've also been informed by the Department of Water and Power that they will also be seeking a rate action. And pursuant to the rate process that has been adopted by the City Council, we have been, the CLA and the CAO have been authorized and actually given the authority to, by the City Council, that whenever that rate action is proposed by the Department of Water and Power, to seek an independent third party to review the financial structure of the DWP to make sure that they have complied with all necessary reviews and all financial plans in order to see if the rate action is in fact needed. Now let me ask a question since the voters just passed the Office of Public Accountability with the rate payer advocate. Once that office is in place and fully functioning, would that obviate the need for an ongoing contractual relationship? Or is this apples and oranges? Well, did you want to get into something? Bill Koenig, CAO's office. I believe it's really apples and oranges because what we're talking about here is a technical expertise that the City would not need to have constantly, only at the time the Department proposes a rate adjustment. Then we get into the mode where we bring in experts on to review the revenue requirements and what is being proposed. So I would say it's on an as-needed basis? Yes. That's what we believe the most economic way to handle this issue. And we also feel that once the rate payer advocate comes on, this would be another tool for them to use. Okay. So if you had to define what the purpose is for entering into this agreement, it's because of their – well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Tell me. It would be to continue the work that was included in all the motions the Council has taken so far to complete the ECAF and to go into the rate restructuring that was also proposed and to review the IRP, which is the Integrated Resource Plan. Those are all outstanding. Plus we know that sometime in May or June they will have a rate action that's proposed. Now, do you have an – or does the contract set forth an existing work plan for conducting the review? Yes. The CAO and CLA have entered into negotiations with PA Consulting with regard to the work plan. The work plan is part of the contract. The contract is in draft form and until it is approved by the Council. But, yes, there are very specific delivery points and there are very specific work plans. And is $780,000 sufficient enough to analyze all the areas raised by the IRP? Yes, we believe that it is because in the past we have only done rate actions and rate actions have cost us $650,000. So with all the additional work plus the rate action, we believe that $780,000 will be the amount that has been negotiated and accepted by PA and it will be a flat rate and it will be not to exceed. Okay. And we've been joined by Mr. Alarcon. One last question on item number three. Could you just articulate on the record the expertise that PA Consulting has to conduct this consolidated review and to do it in such an – in an independent manner? 
I'm sorry, would you repeat the question? The expertise that PA has beyond what the department would possess and that they're able to conduct a consolidated review in an independent manner, basically outside of the scope of the department, but stand alone. Stand alone? Okay. Yes, they have worked with the city during the ECAF, and they have reviewed everything that the department put forth at that time. They gained knowledge of the department's financial. It's been about a year since they were involved with the department. They also are independent in the sense that at that time they performed in an independent manner and were able to come up with something that was not influenced by the department. Okay. Actually, also to add to it, one of the biggest components is the firm that does the IEA study, which is every five years under the charter, the Industrial Economic Administrative Study, usually gets these kinds of contracts generally because they've done the full diagnostic on the department. They understand it pretty much better than anybody on the street. So this is kind of the practice that the city has been following over the course of the past several last IEAs. Okay. Mr. Alicorn, do you have anything? Okay, great. All right. We still don't have a quorum, so this will be a communication. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item is four. Number four? Yeah. We don't have any speaker cards. Do we? Only two for general public comment. Okay, great. Mr. Cardenas has joined us, so we now have a quorum. Okay. We've just finished item three. Item one was a consent item, and we discussed item two. As well. It was also approved. So now that we do have a quorum, unless you want to go back and ask questions on one, two, or three. All right. So one, two, and three. One, two, and three. I'll ratify that and approve it. Yeah. Okay. Number four, DWP report relative to an agreement with Averts Microsystems to furnish and deliver broadcaster network equipment and software services. Good morning. Gene Gamache. I'm the assistant director with DWP-ITS. This is a five-year contract, a one plus one plus one plus one contract, and the maximum expenditure is $950,000 per year, and it's really a contract to upgrade and maintain our existing broadcast video network. We spent $2 million in the past five years for this network, and we've made $3 million in revenue for this broadcasting solution. We maintain about $500,000 worth of revenue, and we hope to maintain these customers with the existing equipment. With this additional system, we expect to hopefully double that to about $1 million a year because of the new technologies that are in place with this new technology. The existing technology is getting old and obsolete, and so with this contract, we hope to, in addition to maintain this equipment, to upgrade that to get in new customers to do video and broadcasting here within the city. Okay. Someone else? I'm Ken Kinsey, director of the Fire Broadcasting Enterprise. Basically here for support for Gene. I do want to point out that part of the economics of putting in the upgrade and expansion of this network is that it gives us labor savings. Things that we have to do manually with a truck rollout to the field can be done via software once this is implemented. Hi, my name is Robert Roth, Office of the CAO. It should be noted that this system is a proprietary system owned by Everett's and that they're the only supplier of parts and components. So if the department intends to continue using this, they had stated that this was the only option. They were the only company to use. So this is a $4.75 million contract, and I'd like to know, excuse me, since this is a sole source contract, if you can talk about the reason for pursuing a sole source. Are the services of a proprietary nature and solely provided by this firm, and is the price competitive? Who wants to take all those questions? Well, let me start with the pricing is very competitive. There are a number of players in this industry. Pretty much each one is a proprietary solution. It's not a standard technology such as an Ethernet network or something. They are proprietary solutions for each vendor. So you look at the vendors and their product offerings and their price points, and this is the most competitive of the major players in the game. 
What about um, the uh, why? Why? Why is it sole source? Is that because there's why? Why the sole source? Uh, typically, there. Well, Ebert's gear because once you select uh, a technology, you kind of roll with that technology unless you're going to change out everything that you have. We're trying to maintain our existing equipment and upgrade and use the pieces that we have in place from the previous installation to integrate with the newer stuff. So it needs to be Ebert's. What, um, how are these uh, network services and equipment accessed by businesses? Uh, that's through uh, a contractual agreement with uh, FOE uh, and the DWP. Uh, we do point-to-point -point and point-to-multi-point and point -point video circuits mm -hmm. for broadcasters, for TV stations, for studios and post-production houses to shuttle video around the city and support that industry in Los Angeles. Okay, so explain to me from, from the economics of it, because I'm not clear, how does this uh, technology benefit local businesses in terms of being remaining competitive? Well, we provide a service that at a competitive price point and some services that are not possible from other uh, providers in the space, uh, particularly at, a, at, at the price points that we offer it. So we provide competition for the other carriers and make it more cost effective and inexpensive for companies to move video around. Like the major studios, when they have a project, they contract with a post-production house and they have to constantly move video back and forth for a theatrical film or a TV show. And uh, otherwise, they would have to ship it over by truck. And, and there's a lot of security issues with transport. So there are a lot of reasons why you want to do that digitally. OK. We're also joined by Mr. Krikorian. Um, so we do have a, a quorum now. Um, we had a quorum a minute ago. But yeah, OK. Do we have any uh, questions from any other members? Mr. Cardenas. Yeah. Um, how much uh, how many how much DWP dollars have been spent toward Everett Everett's so far and how much has been spent internally with DWP for this infrastructure? Well we've uh, expended about two million dollars in Everett's uh, with the Everett's contract in the past. Uh, we've recouped about three million dollars in revenue so we're about a million dollars ahead on the on the ROI. And uh, so this is 4.75 million spread across potentially five years? Yes. Or is yes. 4.75 million? The, the word potentially is good because what we're trying to do is build out the initial phase of this project. And we are meeting with our customers and explaining to them the services that we'll be able to offer. And there's a lot of excitement about the, the advanced technology we're offering. One of the factors behind this was the move to HD, for example. The high definition video signals require much higher bandwidth and different uh, network gear. So we're having to upgrade to support that. Uh, we expect to maintain uh, our half a million dollars a year in, in current customers and to expand on that. Uh, we estimate that we can get up to about a million dollars a year in revenue. Now, what we're going to do is throttle those expenditures based on customer response and the number of circuits that we put up. We we will buy equipment as needed to support the additional expansion, additional customers that we get. So that 950000 a year over five years is a maximum that right. we spend. It's so just the maximum expenditure. We don't expect to possibly pay, you know, to spend $950,000 a year. So basically it's rolling at about $950,000 a year. Right now it's actually generating an income of about $500,000 a year. But the expectation, I presume, is that as you build it out, and as the word gets out and as the quality that we're able to prove that we're able to provide to this industry, then that's what gives us the idea that we might be able to actually bring about a million dollars in revenue a year. Yes, that yes. and the fact that we've actually, we actually did about three quarters of a million dollars a year in business in, in some previous years. And that's been a trading away from us because of our inability to support the high definition video signals. So as we incorporate that capability in the new system. We expect to maintain our existing customers, not have them drift away, and to recapture some of those customers we've had in the past because they've told us they, they want to do business with us, but they have to have this service. Who are they going to when they leave us? It, it depends. It's a variety of other carriers, including AT&T and some others that can provide that sort of transport. 
Councilman? So this is, this is something that big telecommunications corporations are involved in as well? Yes, that's correct. Uh, Council Member, uh, there are other cities as well that provide this service, such as uh, Burbank and Santa Monica. And they very much are um, trying to encourage businesses from Los Angeles to relocate for this service. So, so this is part of a, an infrastructure attraction when it comes to a city yes. or, or, or municipal jurisdiction? Yes. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, great. That was uh, number four. Move. Uh, approve. Recommend Second. approval. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Number five, PDP report relative to authorize the department to use a construction manager at risk process criteria relative to the Silver Lake Reservoir storage replacement project. Okay, I have a really simple question for you to start. What is a construction manager at risk? <laughs> okay. uh, it, it's something new for us. Um, Tell us about The Department it. of Airports has, uh, has successfully done this and is in the process of, uh, of using construction manager at risk. Traditionally, we do a design, what's called a design bid build, where we um, engineer the, the, uh, the plans and specifications and then go out for a, a competitive bid for a, a project. Um, it takes a, a quite a bit of time. You have to, to, to complete the, all of the design and, and in preparation of those materials, and then you go out onto the street. Um, we're on a tight time frame uh, with this project, and one advantage to the construction manager at risk is to compress that schedule. What happens is we, we go out with a, an, an RFP and engage a contractor up front. Construction manager at risk is generally a, a general contractor type of, of out, outfit. They are able to come in as the designs are being finished and do some constructability reviews as the designs are, are, are nearing completion so that they can get the you know, best value for the project as we're um, going to the end. Often when we, when we did a project at the end, um, the, the plans are set and, and they have to, to, to build whatever is on those plans and specs. This way they have a little more input and, and a little more um, opportunity for, for savings on, on, you know, value for the project. Um, we're on a tight time frame here, November 2014, when we're trying to get this project completed. This is a storage reservoir up by Griffith Park. Um, so we feel that by using this methodology, we'll be able to bring them on sooner. We can get started with some of the construction sooner uh, and, and complete that on time. So uh, Mr. Caress has just joined us. Uh, was the traditional contract project not preferred in this instance because of uh, time constraints or? It was mostly time constraints. We had some, some early problems that, that developed early in the design of the project. There are some geotechnical problems on the west side of, of the reservoir property. It was originally envisioned as a 110 million gallon reservoir all in one unit. Um, we had some competent soil on the, the east side and some incompetent soil or, or problems on the west side. That delayed some of the design and pushed us up, up against the, uh, the time frames that we needed to get this thing completed. Okay, so those unanticipated uh, uh, issues Ge geotechnical came up that problems. shortened your time frame or Correct. ate up time. And uh, so your use, use of the construction manager at risk is to save money that you Basically, time time has cost you uh, to make up for that. Yeah, mostly to, to compress that schedule so we have adequate time to do the construction. So actually, you're trying to stay on schedule. Yes. Okay. Uh, does, is there any downside to this uh, this approach in terms of management and oversight? It will be challenging. We'll have to, to because this will be new for us. We'll have to pay more attention and and have closer collaboration with that con constructor and contractors. Um, we will be going out with the big packages for construction. They will be going out for competitive bids for these subcontracts, and we'll be involved in that process with the, con with the, the construction manager at risk or the general contractor. Now, I think uh, the CAO report notes that the requested action will not have a fiscal impact, um, but the contract awarded subsequent to that does have a cost. The cost is expected to be $214 million to build the reservoir. So I need to reconcile whether or not uh, DWP 
has budgeted for the cost in, in an upcoming project or is there a need to identify new funds for the project? This has been identified for a number of years and, and we've had the, the project budget in our, in our budgets that have passed in, in the past. So, so the, the money is there. Um, we've been doing a lot of cutting and, and trying to economize on all of the, the, the budgets. This is one of the projects that is required by EPA and, and so we're under a regulatory deadline. So the funds have been, been earmarked for that for a number of years. Why does the project involve building two reservoirs instead of one? It's basically because of the, the, the underground conditions. On the, on the east side we have good competent soil, on the west side it's not so. And so we have to do some more engineering hmm. to, uh, to finish the design of that, that west side. But we want to get started because we can, we can meet the compliance date by finishing the east reservoir okay. and then we'll move on to the west reservoir. Okay. Um, any committee members uh, have questions? Questions? Okay. Okay. Just one. Probably obvious, but there's already been a lot of work that's been progressing on this project. Mm -hmm. So, what's the scope of work that is going out in this that differs from what's already been completed? We have um, we do these projects in phases, and the first phase was the earthwork. So we have already started on the earthwork with our own forces on the on the east reservoir. So we're basically building a pad to construct this reservoir on. So that's being done now, and if you've seen the, uh, all the earth moving equipment out there, they're, they're going like gangbusters out there. Um, but they will be finished about uh, October, November of this year, and then we'll be able to start the, the actual construction of the, of the facility. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, you move to approve? Just, just to let you know, uh, Madam Chair, this matter will require a two-thirds vote in council. Under the charter, requires okay. two-thirds uh, when it's in council. Mr. Kerfrey moves. Mr. Carter seconds. <coughs> that takes us to item number six. Number six. Yeah. DWP report and city attorney ordinance relative to the proposed geothermal lease agreement with SCAPA, the Southern California Public Power Authority. And by the way, I don't have any cards. I don't have the cards yet. Oh, sorry. There's just two right there for general public comment. Yeah, that's it? Okay, that's, that's it. how we got okay. Madam Chair and Council Members, my name is Randy Howard with the Department of Water and Power. What we have before you is uh, seeking your approval to lease approximately 3,110 acres of land that the department owns in the Salton Sea area down in Imperial County to Southern California Public Power Authority for an initial term of three years with an option of an additional 32 years. Uh, this land would be combined with land uh, about 2,200 acres that's being also turned over to SCAPA for the potential development and exploration of geothermal resources in the Salton Sea. The department initially acquired most of this land in 2006. We acquired a little over 6,000 acres down in the Imperial County for the potential development of geothermal, uh, looking at options that might allow us to reduce our coal requirements. And so this is uh, one of those projects. We're taking a portion of the land and turning it over to SCAPA under a lease uh, at $100 an acre per year rent and then there is a royalty structure as well. In the SCAPA project, there are a number of other cities involved, uh, including Burbank, Glendale, Colton, and Pasadena. and Pasadena, as well as Imperial Irrigation District. Quick question about the potential cost impacts to the Department of Water Power and to the ratepayers uh, if the Department of Water and Power participates in phase two of this project. Are there? What's before you is the leasing of the land that would allow a project to explore. Once the exploration is completed, we would have a better sense of what the potential will be. We've done a number of studies with consultants. Mm -hmm. uh, we've looked at the potential of the land. We believe there is in excess of 200 megawatts of potential geothermal resource. But until we do the from 50 megawatts to 200, phase one is a 50 megawatt. Mm -hmm. 
with the potential of up to two hundred if the projects would go we would come back before this committee and the board if we were to proceed in a project first we need to drill down explore those resources ability then this is exploration okay so we're that's why there's an initial three-year lease term with an option for up to 32 years if we find good resource we would then develop the plan for a project and then come back before this body so you wouldn't consider this project to be in development yet no this project is not in development so pre-development that's correct to determine whether or not to develop that's correct okay all right so then there's you're not at a phase one or a phase two then no we have not made a determination on to proceed on a 50 megawatt or a 200 megawatt project at this point um madam chair yeah um I did include uh, the future costs because the first time this be came before the committee, we were unsure what getting into the lease would commit the city to. So uh, the, this committee agreed with the CAO that we should send it back for uh, investigation of what the future costs might involve. So in the report, I included those that information, and I also included the fact that Getting into the lease does not commit us to go forward in this project. The only thing it commits us to is the lease. And the, le and the worst we could encounter at that point would be that we would get royalties off of whatever they did uh, get if we were not to participate and the other cities were to, to go on. I also asked them just what the potential would be to see if they had thought out the process if we did continue. So that's why the, that extra information is included in the report, just to show you the potential should they encounter uh, geothermal uh, uh, possibilities. But mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that they had thought through the whole process, should they encounter that, yes, we do have possibilities. But I wanted to make sure that we were not committed just by going into the lease. Okay, so then explain just what the royalty provisions are that the Department of Water and Power would be subject to uh, under this long-term lease agreement uh, if they decide they want to go ahead and pursue this. If initially what will happen is the lands will go over to SCAPA under a project agreement for exploration. We will receive a rental payment of about three hundred and eleven thousand dollars a year uh, for for the land while the exploration is occurring if we were to go forward in an actual project so we would come back before you with a project agreement the royalty rate would be a four percent now we wouldn't pay ourselves necessarily a royalty rate but the other participants in the project would pay us uh, royalties related to any resources found on our property uh, if we chose not to proceed so if the other participants chose to proceed in the project and we chose not to proceed uh, we would receive a four percent royalty from them on the lands uh, while they were being utilized for the develop or for the production of geothermal resources Okay, now, um, Mr. Seeley, one last question, I'll go to you. Uh, the, since this is a long-term lease agreement that does exceed uh, 30 years, um, yeah. I know we have to make a two-thirds vote, um, but we also have to have a finding that this is in the best interest of the city yeah. uh, for such an uh, extremely long commitment like yes. this. Right. Uh, so what's the standard or what standard we measure whether or not something is in the best interest of the city? The, well, yeah, that's, that's actually a very <coughs> – we have a – actually dealt with the situation before, at least our committee in, in, in recent times. So we have to check with the city attorney with respect to how to actually deal with that, what the standard is and so forth. When this matter is before you in council, which we admit, I think it's going to be this Friday, we should have an answer for you. Um, but uh, there, there is a charter section that specifies that um, these long-term lease agreements require a fine to be made with respect to that it is in the best interest in the city to proceed. Is this time sensitive? It's only time, time sensitive from the perspective a uh, number of other cities have, have approved it and were ready to do some exploration, but no, if it was held over, 
uh, would be comfortable. All right. Can you make sure that we get something from the city attorney there for Friday's meeting? Because I don't want to. I don't want to make a, take a final vote on this without knowing what sure. that means in terms of quote best interest of the city end quote. Sure. I'm not really sure what that means. Oh, I know. Well, we have the city, city attorney oh, there. Oh, the city, oh, the city oh, attorney, attorney right here. Good. Okay, <laughs> I can answer your questions. I would think you would measure it by uh, market value of rentals within the Imperial County. That's what we initially based it on when we tried to negotiate among ourselves what the rental rate would be. Um, uh, our business people took um, a compilation or extrapolation of what the value of the land was within that area and tried to measure it as to what the rental rates would be. And so it, you would have to independently verify that, or we could provide additional information from our business teams on how that um, is calculated. I, I, I'd like an independent verification on the record, and I, I'd prefer to have it in some sort of written communication uh, to the council for the official record. When you said Friday? Okay. We're, we're actually checking that. I think we confused it with item number, the Everett's uh, item as well. So we'll double check that. Okay. Um, well, just because of the length, because of the length, I have to make us finding of best interest of the city. No, we're talking about the schedule of when it's, when it's going to Oh, when it's, co when it's yeah. going to cancel? Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and if I may, <coughs> it's, it will be interesting to know what the general market rate analysis is for this. But um, thinking about this m more strategically, which I, I would think we need to do in determining what the best interests of the city are, I'm just curious why when we're facing the difficult uh, renewable energy mandates that we have imposed in this city and we're facing AB 32 compliance deadlines in a constrained market for renewable energy when we have land that is adjacent to existing transmission and we have baseload renewable energy that might be on that land, why are we using SCAPA for this rather than developing it directly uh, or exploring and then developing it directly ourselves? And then if other utilities want to participate dealing with it then. It seems to me that it would, I mean, I'm sure there's a risk uh, sharing kind of uh, issue involved, but it seems to me that it would be at least worth exploring the idea of DWP proceeding independently to explore its own renewable energy resource on its own land next to its own existing transmission path. That's that's an, uh, a very good question. We acquired about 6,000 acres, as I indicated previously. This is about half of what we own down in Imperial County. Uh, in previous RFPs that we've issued for renewable resources, we have put some of these lands in those proposals in the RFPs, seeking f proposals from developers that we would independently uh, contract with to develop those. Uh, we have not yet found a structure that was economical or worked for us. And what we had here was an opportunity. Imperial Irrigation District owns about 44,000 acres around us. So there was an opportunity through SCAPA. They are a SCAPA member as well. And they came together and said, look, we'll put in about half the lands. You put in about half the lands on a project. Let's share the risk. Let's, let's share the benefits and see if we can pull a few other cities into the project. So it, again, it was to share risk. It was to share the cost and to, to build a bigger project than we might do on our own. So that, that was the intent. It, this is not all of our, our holdings down in the area. But with the potential of Imperial Irrigation District being involved and in the amount of land resources they do control, the belief was they m would potentially come forward later with additional lands if the projects were successful. Yeah, it seems, uh, seems that we're, we're discussing two separate issues. One is essentially a real estate transaction, and the other is exploration. Uh, I don't have a problem with making the finding on the real estate transaction if, if there's a guaranteed 4% return. Uh, on the exploration, can you describe DWP's experience in, in exploration or these kinds of projects? Well, DWP does not have a lot of experience in, in exploring geothermal resources. Uh, we have hired Geothermex, which is probably the premier geothermal consultant 
we also formed an agreement with the Aerospace Corporation. The Aerospace Corporation is a quasi-federal uh, entity. Wait, wait, uh, are you talking about previous experience or are you talking about this contract? For for looking at these I, properties I'm talking for about potential. previous experience. Can you tell us uh, DWP's previous experience in exploration? Our only experience that I'm aware of related to the drilling of for potential resources has come out of our operations and our ownership of the Pinedale gas field in Wyoming. Uh, we have drilled uh, a substantial number of wells there and explored for the natural gas but not geothermal. How do we do? Uh, we have done quite well in our gas field. What, what does that mean? Uh, we have very good production. We have a very uh, competitive price coming out of our, mm -hmm. our gas field. Our so how do we uh, assess the, the, the merit relative to the finding of benefit for the ratepayers? Uh, how, do we, how do we measure the exploration uh, the quality of the uh, the proposed exploration project. May, may, may I answer that question? I think you're I don't know. with respect to your approval of the lease versus um, the, the exploration of the project. With respect to the lease, the city is guaranteed or the department is guaranteed uh, a consistent revenue stream irrespective of whether or not we right. confirm the presence of geothermal that's resources. That's the 4%. Uh, right. That's the annual rental $100 payment. an acre uh, for rental payment. Right. Okay. The, the, the royalty rates will not be triggered unless there's actually a confirmation of the presence of geothermal resources and that it can a confirmation that it can be produced in commercial quantities. So, so what, what, why do we have to approve uh, both at this time as opposed to just approving the lease agreement? You're, you're, you're just approving the, the lease. You're just approving the so lease. We're just, okay, that, that's what I wanted to get the, to. There is a separate MOU that was approved by the Board of Water and Power, Power Commissioners quite some time ago that's separate and apart from this lease but operates in conjunction with it. So we retain the option to uh, participate in um, a geothermal extraction program. Right. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think we could make the finding on the, on the real estate agreement I, and then uh, the, the exploration, uh, whether or not we participate in the, in the geothermal project, uh, we'll have a second. Let me, that I'm sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. Okay. Let me clarify for the record. There are three stages to a, the a geothermal project. There's the exploration stage, then there's the resource development stage, and then there's production. At this point, what uh, um, geothermal lease is intended to do is complement the MOU that was previously approved by the board to say we're going to rent our lands for the purpose to see if there's any resource on the land. If there is a resource that has been confirmed, then there are different mechanisms that will come back before this um, um, board and committee if a more detailed development is occurring. But right now, there's no evaluation or even agreements that have been prepared that discusses the resource development of a project. Okay, so, so we're just trying to confirm whether one is even viable. Okay, so we're not paying for, are we paying for the cost of the exploration? Yes, and under the MOU, there will be some cost associated okay, with Okay, so that. then this vote would be approving that as well? No. 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 Okay, so that's going to come back at some later point. Right? No, that's actually approved by, it was approved by the board only because it involves governmental entities and didn't require city council approval. Oh, so so I would think that the the greater risk is in, in that decision. Uh, well, can you describe the risks? Uh, that are before the committee at this time? The, the risk before the committee at this time related to the lease, I think you, you've heard from the city attorney, are the city is guaranteed a, a rental rate uh, from the participants. But that doesn't sound like a risk. I mean, what, what would the risk the, be? I mean, locking in the land? Well, the, 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 the potential risk might be that this is, 
there might be uh, an incredible resource found. A better use. And okay. now, now we've we've We're, put well, we our property it, into Mr. a joint Corian project. Okay, okay. Yeah. So we put the property into a joint project. There's a lot of uh, potential there. And we're not keeping it all just for ourselves. So in essence, we're we're trying to uh, we're taking this uh, uh, a safer course, as opposed to the uh, uh, a more radical approach that that might generate huge profits or something. Theoretically, theoretically, yeah. Okay, I, I'm fine with that. Mr. Cardinus, I think Mr. Perez has a question. So, uh, when it comes to the land, I I see the only risk is that of locking up land that we already own and control and then having to share at least 50 percent of the potential uh, of that land with our SCAPA partners or the partners in this particular agreement. Um, however, um, I have a question about what, what is the – who has power lines that, that are on or near this property? The Imperial Irrigation District uh, owns and controls the power lines near the property. Do we own or control any power lines near or on the property? No, we do not. Okay, so. Um, and for the record, that's outside of our balancing authority area, so we wouldn't have power lines in Imperial County. Oh no! Excuse me, we have power lines all over the place, don't we? <laughs> I think Path 42 is the closest to the. No, but I mean, area. we have power lines all the way through Utah across California. Yeah. Correct. So the reason why I wanted to ask that question is because now whatever we invest in out there, we're going to have to deal with another authority when it comes to getting that power to our basin, correct? That is correct. Where are and we they, they, uh, one of the benefits of, of the lease and the joint participation is they are one of the members in the project. Yeah, but they might be one of the members, but at the same time they're still running a business per se. Correct. Um. Councilman, uh, I did uh, have a meeting with the transmission group regarding this issue because that was also one of the issues that we had returned the, for, the file for. And they have, and I'd be glad to have them supply to your office, uh, the different alternatives that they looked at, the different uh, paths that they would follow, and the, diff and the different costs of each one. And I believe that they have come up with a plan that would be the most efficient and possible to get through from, from that area, so Salton Sea, to Los Angeles. So they have looked at the different options, mm -hmm. and they have come up with the, the least, cost, the least uh, cost among the different alternatives. So that has been thought through, and I'd be glad to have them submit it to your office. Yeah, I'd love to see that. But the, see, the thing is, whenever we're dealing with somebody else, Unless the government uh, regulates what they're capped at charging us, then we have to negotiate. And we really don't know what those costs are until we ink agreements with one or two or three or four entities to get that energy here. If I, mean, I, if I may speak to I support the transmission group um, from the legal division. There is a pending application for a Path 42 upgrade that contemplated what um, transmission capabilities would be needed for this project if it did move forward. So that is pending um, with the Imperial Irrigation District as we speak. So what what that means is the Imperial Irrigation District is looking at a, an upgrade of an existing that transmission line. Question, what's capacity? So Path 42 is, is a pathway that gets transmission to a point in the Cal ISO where the department currently does have some rights uh, bringing our Palo Verde power through. So they have proposed an upgrade that they want to proceed with. We have put in, they had an open season. So open season means, you know, they want to find out who's interested, how much you'd like, so they know exactly how to build that upgrade. Uh, they have proceeded with that process. We have submitted as a project team uh, a request into that process for a piece of that upgrade. That means we would potentially share in the cost of that upgrade in order to um, be able to bring the power to a point that the department might be able to pick it up. So we, we have been working um, for the last number of years looking at transmission alternatives. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware, you know, we participated. Green Path was an attempt to, to bring a transmission lying down into that area. We've backed away from that and looked at other alternatives. 
and uh, as the CAO has indicated, uh, we have prepared somewhat of a report on those various alternatives. There are several options with different cost structures and different risk uh, that we've, we've looked at if we were to go forward with the project. Again, that would all come back before this body at such time that we proceeded with a project. So the bottom line is all the potential variables are already being explored and all the potential partners or future um, uh, infrastructure are all concurrently being explored and whatever parties we're having to deal with, we've already been contacting them and letting them know that we may be looking to uh, create agreements with them to get, our, to get this potential energy to our, our city. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Perez. Yeah, first, if I could ask a follow-up to Mr. Cardinal's questions. Uh, what I think we want to avoid and, and clarify that we're not getting into a situation where we have the resource, everything is going well, and we don't have a commitment to exactly what we're paying for it. And uh, this irrigation district can then charge us through the nose. Um, at what point do we actually nail down whatever the maximum is that they could charge us? Are you referring to transmission? Yes. Okay, well, I, I wasn't able to review the email, but we did receive um, the cost of upgrades today and this morning um, from Imperial Irrigation District, so those figures will be more succinct um, if you want to ask that question at City Council. I didn't review it, unfortunately, so I can't tell you the exact number of what our the DWP's potential cost would be for the Path 42 upgrade, but they have been transmitted by IID. So is that our only cost, or, or do they then charge us for the use of, of their facilities, and will we have that charge uh, nailed down before we move ahead with this process? We, we will have uh, a full financial analysis related to the potential development and production cost. You know, our expectation would be it would be a plant that we would jointly own and participate in for excess of 30 years, so the desire would be that we would come forward uh, with some fairly solid numbers and, and a feasibility that would indicate that this is the right project for the, the rate payers of LA to participate in. And again, looking at our various options for reducing our need for coal, um, we believe this is a, a very strong area. And right now what we're seeking is really the, the ability to explore and determine what is that potential and how much could be developed that could, we could bring home to the city of Los Angeles. Yeah, I'm still not sure I got an answer to my question. Um, is there a charge for the use of their, their facilities, their transmission lines, and will we have a, a commitment to exactly what, what the maximum is that we could pay for that, um, or are we just paying for the service and, and uh, at some period of time they could decide that it's, it's more valuable than what we were paying for before and increase that rate? Their, trans, their Path 42 upgrade is separate and apart from this project that's before you. It, it's a separate issue. We, LADWP got in the queue in the event that uh, council was to approve this lease and um, the board approved the MOU, so we reserved the ability of not having stranded transmission, but those upgrades and that project is separate and apart, and then they have an open access tariff, which sets their standard that's uniform among everyone and non-discriminatory. Okay. Somehow you're still not answering my I'm question. Sorry. Do we Are yeah. we paying to use their lines, we, and are we going to have a commitment for exactly yeah. what we're paying for if we're paying for it? Yeah, we are Or are not. they just going to charge us year by year and, and at some point jack up our rates if this project works that way? Yeah, Councilman, we are not paying currently because we're not utilizing the transmission currently. If we bring forward a project uh, back to this committee that we want to develop, uh, we will have a, a firm idea as to the transmission requirements as well as the cost. They have an obligation to post a standard rate similar to rates that we post. People uh, come to the department, want to use our transmission line. We have rates posted. They have been calculated based on cost of service. Uh, they will have something similar to that. So it, it will be a standard. It won't be jacked up 
related to just our project. It, it won't necessarily be, there could be a negotiated rate based on our participation in the transmission line, but again, it'll be a, a standard, a very transparent rate structure. Could they increase that standard year by year, or will we, will we actually negotiate a there, price for that whole period? Yeah. There, there are federal uh, rules. Um, could they increase it? Yes, if there are increased costs, they could increase it, but typically it would have to be a cost-based increase. So there would have to be a demonstration of increased cost associated with the increased cost to us. Gotcha. And one other question, uh, just on, I've never dealt with a geothermal plant before. Um, on what basis do we select this area to explore? Um, is it just because it's a, a large piece of land? Are there geothermal fields nearby? What, how do we decide, since we don't know that there actually is a resource, how did we get to this point? The, the Salton Sea is one of the most prevalent geothermal fields in the U.S. Uh, there are, just south of our property, there are, are several hundred megawatts of geothermal uh, plants producing today. Most of them have been online in excess of 20 years uh, without seeing a diminished resource. It, our properties and the, the Imperial Irrigation District properties are in what's known as a known geothermal resource area. It's been identified that there is a very significant potential. The State of California, uh, California Energy Commission has identified almost 2,000 megawatts of additional potential in this resource area. So um, there, there are a number of, of uh, consultants, uh, geologists that have determined this is a very prevalent area. That's why we acquired the property initially. And uh, now we're just trying to explore what is that exact potential on our properties uh, and for resource development. So are we? close to 100% certain that we find some resource uh, on this property? Or what, what would you say the percentage is that, uh, of likelihood? Just so you know, we're going to continue this item. So because we have time. Um, the CLA has corrected us uh, on the, when it's coming to council. So when, once you conclude your questions, Mr. Koretz, we're going to give some guidance to the uh, staff assembled here so they can come back and answer your questions and all of our questions in greater depth. Okay, well that's my last question, but do we have an answer for it? As to the certainty, uh, I think we have a, a very high probability we will find geothermal. It's just will we find it in the um, enough of the resource to make the investment of a, of a geothermal power plant worthwhile. Uh, we know there, there is a resource there. We just don't know the quantity of that resource until we actually explore with drilling. We obviously think there's a pretty good chance or this would be a, a pretty big risk. Yes. Our, the consultants that we have hired that have uh, reviewed all the data have indicated to us that there is a very high probability we will find a solid resource. Thank you. Okay, great. We're going to, uh, CLA tells us that this is coming to council. How much time do we have? Actually, Madam Chair, this, this one, we confuse it with item number four. Uh, you have more time on this. There is no time limit on, with regard to this matter. So if the committee wishes to, uh, for, for the department staff, our office, yeah. to, to review the tape, compile a list of questions that have been, that have been asked, have response prepared, yeah. as well as the best interest standard issue. Yeah, uh, I would like we'll a full analysis that. on that. Yeah, at least a million. <laughs> yeah. So do you think we have time? You think we got time? Not at the pace I, I, we're going. Yeah, we're going. <laughs> okay, great. So why don't you come back for the next meeting, and then the city attorney can give us a complete analysis in written form on the best interest of the city standard. Okay. And uh, Mr. Krikorian, I think the CAO said something in which you were interested. I was primarily interested in this the issue, the strategic decision of whether to go it alone or to, to lease through SCAPA and explore through SCAPA. It was uh, addressed, but okay. if there are other, you know, if we get into that in a little bit greater depth, I think that would be useful. How this fits into the longer term IRP uh, renewable energy options that we have would be good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Koretz, are your questions answered or you want to add yes. to the list? No. Okay. All right. Great. So this will be continued for two weeks, and that marks the end of our official agenda.
And now we go into the public comment portion. We have two public comment cards, uh, Chris, Kirsten Sabo and Bill Heller. Heller? Okay. Oh. Did we go back and ratify? We did. Yes. Yeah, we did. That. Okay. All the other items, yes. Yeah, okay, great. When you have a form. When you great. Okay, great. I'm going to let Bill speak first. We're Great. speaking together on the same topic. Okay. Thank you. So, hey. It would, it would help if, if uh, the council members okay. are right. well, the document. Thank you so much. Start the timer. Great. I promise not to speak. Great. You just did. <laughs> we have to go downstairs to council. That's why we're very conscious of time. Right. 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 Madam Chair, honorable members of the Energy and uh, Environment Committee, my name is Bill Haller. In the last few years, I've appeared before your committees as the Lake Balboa Neighborhood Council President, representing more than 40,000 stakeholders in our district in CD6. I've also appeared before this body as the Volunteer State Chair of Sierra Club California's Air Quality Committee, representing more than 150,000 club members in our state. Today, I come to you uh, as an LADWP ratepayer, representing what I believe to be the best interests of 3.8 million residents. In December of 2010, I received a tip as a result of my environmental blogging on Griffith Park Way as I began researching and writing about hexavalent chromium-6 in the Headworks area of Griffith Park. The email document now in your possession is that tip. The LEDWP inner office document indicates that on February 1, 2010, more than a year ago, soil samples came back to LEDWP showing extremely high level of hexavalent chromium-6 in the Headworks area of Griffith Park, about eight times the U.S. EPA's concern level for industrial soil exposure. As backup, I've also enclosed my writing from the Griffith Park Wayas blog for the links. You'll have to go to the blog. Uh, we all know the name of Baron Brockovich. She brought to light the activities of how private utility tried to hide the incredibly damaging effects of Hex 6 visited on the men, women, and children in Hinckley, California. Yet here we are in 2011 with the possibility of our own Hinckley, and after 14 months of no true information or action by the LEDWP, the people of the city of Los Angeles still remain largely unaware of the actual danger contained in headwork soil because someone, some group, or some attorney at LADWP thought it in the public's best interest not to inform them. So this year we've had days and days and days of high winds. We've had days that kick up dirt and dust. We've had days of rain. My question that I would ask this council to ask the LADWP is whose lives, whose families are we protecting by not informing the public that there are extremely high levels of Hex 6 buried in Headworks industrial soil? I ask that this committee take immediate action and let the public know with certainty that it is safe to bike, ride, or play in the area adjacent to Griffith Park, or at Thank least you. tell us to steer clear of an environmental hazard. Thank, Thank you. For you. Your time. Uh, Kristen Sabo? Uh, yeah, my name is Kristen Sabo. I live in uh, Councilmember Kerkorian's district. I work for Phoenix House, which is a nonprofit in Richard Allerton's district, and I'm thrilled to see the two of you still here. Um, I actually am a volunteer with the Parks Department. I work probably eight to 900 hours a year in Griffith Park. And I'm finding out now that there's a possibility that I've been exposed 800 hours a year to this particular very, very dangerous pollutant, chromium-6. Um, you know, a year ago, DWP talked about a stop work order uh, regarding the soil. And I think what you heard today, the Silver Lake Reservoir uh, project, which was item five, actually is the property we're talking about. That's Headworks. And I didn't realize that until I sat down and then went back and looked. Uh, so we are talking about that. And when they said they were going like gangbusters down there, they weren't kidding. I mean, I have a picture here that I took that shows all the excavation. They're putting this up into the air. And it's going down river, into the river, into the air. And people like myself are breathing it 800 hours a year, which is terrifying. I've been there seven years doing hard work for the city on behalf of the people. And uh, this scares the hell out of me. Who else does it scare, should it scare the hell out of? The users at Pecan Grove, at Betty Davis Park, the people who live in the area, the parks workers who are there 12 hours a day, day in and day out. Um, I, I'm really, really disturbed by this. I'm asking you guys as the... The, the people for the city, you know, city council members who are tasked with the safety of the public and environmental protections, I'm asking you to investigate this and do it in a fair and open fashion so that everybody knows what's going on and that people are not 
being exposed continually and they don't know about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. You didn't put your phone number on here. You want to come up here and put your phone number on this card so if somebody would like to reach you, they'll be able to do that? Yes. Okay. Could I ask who is Federico, Federico, excuse me, Blanquiel? I have no idea. I would like that you don't scan this and put this online. I don't want any phone calls. What, scan what? I think phone is up. It is. Could I ask my question? Who is Mark? Who is Mark Mikowski? What is this memo? I can't. What is this? I'm not understanding. In your packet. What is this memo? The memo indicates the actual contamination level of hexavalent 6 in the Hedwig soil. It's highlighted at the bottom of the page. But who are these people? It looks like it's an internal memo in DWP between an attorney and DWP workers. That's my interpretation. I would like you to investigate it as this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.